Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. Let me say at the outset, uh, uh, let me express my gratitude to the Internet Society for giving me the opportunity to be able to participate in this uh, colloquium and to, uh, in particular, share the podium in this last session. Uh, and let me congratulate the Internet Society on achieving its 20 years uh, and on the fantastic work I think that is done to, if I may say, socialise the internet. Um, let me congratulate also my uh, two fellow panellists, uh, uh, Mitchell and Vint, on being inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Internet Hall of Fame last night. I must say this was an extremely moving ceremony, a pageant of historical figures really it was quite extraordinary um, to see the pioneers of the internet and the developers of the internet. I'm going to say a few words uh, in this last session about one of the great challenges, I think, that the internet faces, and that is the question of intellectual property or rights and obligations in respect of the creative works <coughs> that the internet makes available in such an unprecedented way. Um, of course, content is one of the reasons, or creative works is one of the great social uses of the internet and one of the reasons why we all want the internet. And let me recall a story of Henry Thoreau in the 19th century, the halfway through the 19th century when the telegraph was invented. Uh, he said they're building a telegraph from Texas to Maine, but it may be that Texas and Maine have nothing to say to each other. Uh, so that's just to recall that it's not just the technology that is important, it is the social use of the technology, and in particular in this instance, the availability of cre creative works, which is so important. Uh, let me start by uh, saying something about how we can look at intellectual property, because it's in, in itself the subject of some controversy. Um, I would like to quote in this regard Jokai Benkler uh, from one of his TED Talks uh, on the economics of open source or open source economics in which he says, next time you read in a newspaper, and already the metaphor is out of date, but next time you read in a newspaper about an intellectual property decision, it is not about something small and technical. It is about the way in which information, knowledge, and culture are produced and distributed. Uh, so that's an extremely important context, of course. And in that important context, I would encourage you to think of intellectual property as a balancing mechanism for all of the often competing rights and equities that occur in and around the act of creation or innovation. That, I think, is the mission in life of intellectual property. It is not something for these interests or for those interests. It is a mechanism for reconciling these interests and those interests. Uh, now, that task of balancing all the competing interests that occur in and around the act of creation and the distribution of creative works is, of course, in the internet world, no longer a unidimensional task among a few or a small number of actors, as it once may have been for the composition of music or for the performance of a piece of music at the beginning of the 20th century. Because, the, of course, the internet has radically altered the number of creators that are out there. It's radically altered the availability of the previous repertoire or historical record of creation. It's radically altered the size and the location of the potential market. It's indeed the world that we're talking about. And it's radically altered the technology and the cost of the performance and recording of creative works. And in consequence of that, the mission of intellectual property is now a multi-dimensional task which involves the whole world. And that, I would suggest, is why we saw in the last course of the last 12 months, Wikipedia blacked out for one, 24 hours uh, as a consequence of the SOPA and the PIPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, and the 
protect intellectual property acts that were introduced into the United States Congress. It's why we saw Anonymous, the group, attacking the websites of the FBI and the Department of Justice uh, over the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, ACTA. It's why we saw multiple discussions and demonstrations around the world and in various parliaments about the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. Uh, and it's why we see that intellectual property and internet are becoming part even of presidential election campaigns. So on this, what I would like to say to you, I think, is that uh, these political tensions are here to stay. I think we should look at them as a normal part of democratic life in the internet world and in the digital world. What we have to do, I think, is to learn how to manage those tensions in a better way. I think it's absolutely normal that in a knowledge economy and an information economy, where you have around the world some $1.2 trillion invested in the generation of new knowledge each year, in research and development each year. When you have more and more people connected to the internet through a variety of platforms and devices, uh, when you have more and more creative works migrating to the internet, what we find is that intellectual property is becoming increasingly a source of competitive uh, positioning between enterprises, between industries, and between countries or nations. And there will be uh, political tension over property rights in relation to knowledge and culture. And I think, uh, as a first point, we have to learn how to manage these better because they are here to stay. And it's normal part of democratic life. Let me now turn, if I may, to uh, the big issue, if you like, which is the, the great migration of creative content. I mean, I think if we look out over the Serengeti plain of culture, we see this, these herds of wildebeest, you know, packets of content, if you like, or creative works migrating from the analog space to the more hospitable climes of the digital environment. And this great migration is something uh, that I don't think we can ever underestimate the importance of. It is extraordinarily important, and I think, uh, if I may say, it amounts to the re-expression of our culture. Um, it's similar, in other words, in dimension, if you like, to the transition that we will have to undergo from a carbon-based economy to uh, a carbon-free or carbon-neutral economy. It is something in which, uh, a transition in which everything is being re-expressed. Now, when you look at the enormity of that transition, I think it's not surprising that the subject also of intellectual property is uh, not an easy one. Uh, so where are we in uh, this situation, in this transition? And that's, of course, an extremely complex question, uh, and I would like to make uh, just three comments about it, if I may. First of all, I think we need to remember that we have cause to celebrate here with the democratization of knowledge and culture. We are not looking at a problem. We are looking at something which is an extremely positive development. Uh, but secondly, um, I think that we need to ensure as we go forward and as technological change occurs increasingly rapidly, that the policy mission of intellectual property as a balancing mechanism for the various interests in and around the act of creation, we have to make sure that that policy mechanism is neutral to technology and neutral to the business models built upon technology. This is, I think, one of the primary tasks that public policymakers have. The purpose of copyright is not to influence the technological possibilities for creative expression, nor the business models that are built upon those technological possibilities. Nor is it the role of copyright to preserve business models that are established on obsolete or moribund, but moribund technologies. The role of copyright is to play a neutral role in relation to technology and business models built upon technology and to extract some value from cultural exchanges and cultural uses of cultural 
uh, property to return to the creators. Uh, and my final comment, I think, is that I think we should set ourselves an objective here in the intellectual property world, which is, not, which is an easy, easy objective to say, but a much more difficult one to accomplish. And I think the objective should be that we should aim to make it as easy to get creative works or content legally on the internet as it is to get them illegally. And we know that it's very easy to get them illegally. But we should aim, I think, to make uh, it possible to get creative works uh, legally just as easily as we can get them illegally. Now, as I said, that is easily said, but it's a massive task because, again, uh, and I'm speaking a lot about re-expressions, but it involves the re-expression of the business architecture that existed for the territorial world of analog content. And the re-expression of that business architecture uh, in a simple, efficient, global, digital marketplace. And we know that we're on that track, but we are a long way away from achieving it. Uh, and there are all sorts of unevennesses that exist in the legal, uh, the, the law of the global digital marketplace and in the infrastructure of the global digital marketplace. There are many elements that need to be considered here. Uh, I would like to mention just one that I think uh, has been mentioned this morning by Vint Cerf in the, se in the session on intellectual property and, and um, uh, innovation and the internet, uh, and that is the question of registration. You know, the uh, uh, international legal system for copyright is built, the Berne Convention is built upon the basis of no formalities for copyright protection you get copyright protection automatically. Uh, and I think that while we, it's unlikely that we can revisit that principle uh, since it's embedded in an international convention that is uh, adhered to by over 170 countries, it's unlikely that we can do that. But what we can have is voluntary registration systems and we can encourage the use of voluntary registration systems and I think that this is an element of infrastructure that is absolutely indispensable for building the global digital marketplace. To find out, to be able to find out easily who owns the rights and who controls the rights in relation to different pieces of creative content. I'm going to make only one more comment, if I may, um, on this very complex set of questions. Uh, and that is to mention one of the great, of course, features, one of the most uh, beautiful features of the internet is the enlargement that it has facilitated in the participation in creation of cultural works. It's enabled uh, anyone, really, to become an author and a publisher and it has enabled anyone to be a composer or to be a performer or a musician. And this enlargement of participation is, of course, a very special feature uh, and a very valuable feature of the internet. But with it comes a fundamental challenge to our notions of author uh, and authenticity upon which the copyright system is built. Uh, again, it's a very complex question, and I can't go into all of the various dimensions of this question, uh, which are extremely rich. But I would like to mention just one element of it, and that is user-generated content, content. User-generated content, or mashups, if you, if you like, as one form of user-generated contents. It's an extremely uh, serious issue. It's an extremely contemporary issue. It's under exploration uh, by the federal government in Australia, for example. It's under consideration within the context of copyright legislation in Canada. It's under consideration in a number of other uh, countries around the world. Uh, and I would like to emphasize the importance of this issue because if we are going to maintain respect for the institution of intellectual property 
as a balancing mechanism for all of the interests that occur in and around the act of creation, which I certainly hope we will do. And if we are going to take advantage of the multiple possibilities and the rich possibilities to which the internet gives rise, then we're going to have to find a way to address this particular question. Uh, and I think one of the ways that we might be able to address it in the future, I'm speaking entirely informally and uh, uh, in an entirely exploratory manner, is to draw a distinction between market and non-market situations or between commercial and non-commercial situations. And intellectual property actually works on the basis of market and commercial situations, not on the, pri not on the basis of private and non-commercial uses. Uh, and this is a very important possible distinction for intellectual property going into the future because it also involves, for example, if you magnify it out, a distinction between uh, markets in the world uh, in which there are rich and paying consumers and markets in the world in which there are poor and uh, consumers who are unable to pay. Uh, so it's a distinction, I think, that can have a lot of merit in looking at the way in which we go forward in balancing the equities in relation to intellectual property. Thank you very much.